Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to six player game, Garden Guest, designed by Stephen Glenn and published by Van Ryder Games, who helped sponsor this video. Your colony of beetles are out for a pleasant stroll across the garden, but the other beetles keep getting in the way. To succeed, you'll race to create an unbroken line of your pieces from one side of the garden to the other. That'll show them who's boss, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the center of the play area. This is made up of several hexagon spaces, and along its borders, you'll find pairs of matching sides. For example, this side has a row of hexagons matching this side. The same is true here and here, and here and here. Depending on how many players you have, you'll either be on a team with other players or on your own. But to simplify things, in this video and in the rulebook, the term team is used to describe both when a player has a partner or when you're just on a team all by yourself. During the game, each team will be assigned a matching pair of edges. If you have two or three players, each will be on a team by themselves, claiming and sitting near one of the three different edges. If you have four, five, or six players, you'll have partners, and partners should sit across from one another at the table. That said, in a six-player game, you can either play as two teams of three, or three teams of two. If we had three teams of two players each, one would sit here and here, another here and here, and the third team here. This way, teams would alternate as you go clockwise around the table. I should mention, if you have five players, that means two teams of two players, and one team of just a single player, which is just fine. They won't have a teammate sitting across from them, so leave that space empty at the table. And there's a couple other little adjustments to account for in a five-player game that we'll cover during this video. But in this video, we'll assume that we have four players, meaning two teams of two each. Each team now collects what are known as the stone and guest pieces, deck of flowers, and two double-sided collection cards in the color matching their edge of the board. If you have a team of just one player, they keep everything, but with a teammate, you might give them the pieces while you manage the deck. Either way, each team shuffles their deck of flower cards, dealing five to each member of the team. If you have a five-player game, the team with just a single player won't have a partner to deal cards to, and instead deals a total of seven cards to themselves. No matter how many teams you have, the one with the player who last worked in a garden is referred to as Team A. Or you can just pick a team randomly. Then going clockwise around the table, you'll have Team B, and depending on your player count, possibly a Team C. Referring to this chart in the rule book, each team should set their double-sided collection cards so the numbers shown are face up. It doesn't matter the color of the cards, it's their values that are important. So in a four-player game, if we assume this is Team A, it means our collection cards should look like this. The only exception is that in a five-player game, the person who doesn't have a teammate must always be Team C, setting their cards with the four and two face up as shown. Finally, put all of these pedestal markers next to the board. And that's the setup. In Garden Guests, your team, even if it's just a team of one player, will be working to place your pieces on the board in such a way that they create an unbroken line going from any one space on one of your edges of the board to the other before any other team can. To do this, you'll also likely work to block the paths your opponents are trying to make. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the person who was chosen earlier as the start player, and then going clockwise around and around the table. On your turn, you must take one of four possible actions. So let's go through each one, starting with collecting flowers. It doesn't matter which teammate your collection cards might be sitting in front of, they're available to all players on a team. And when taking this action, you pick one of them, draw that many cards from your flower deck, and then after, flip the chosen collection card over. This has a one and a four side. The other has a three and a two side. So let's say for a moment that we chose to use this card. We would then collect three cards from the deck, flipping this one over, which will change the options that are available the next time you or your teammates want to collect flowers. Either way, the cards you have in your hand must always be kept secret from the other players, including your teammate if you have one. 
We'll learn how these are used in a moment, but also be aware you can never have more than 15 cards in your hand. If an action causes you to gain more than 15, then after, you must immediately discard back down. These would then go into a shared discard pile face up beside your deck. If you ever need to draw cards and the deck is empty, just reshuffle the discard pile into a new draw deck. And that's the collect flowers action. Next, let's learn the build a colony action. First, notice the spaces of the board that have a light colored background. These are known as pedestal spaces, which are different than the spaces on the edge or the spaces with a green background that make up most of the board. When you take the build a colony action, you'll be stacking one or more of your guest pieces on a pedestal space. Just keep an eye out for mushroom spaces. These are not pedestals. Beetles do not like mushrooms and no pieces are ever placed onto mushroom spaces. To perform the build a colony action, pick an empty pedestal space and play any number of cards from your hand that match the flower symbol shown on that pedestal. There are four types of flowers in the game which you can distinguish by their art. You'll also find their unique symbol in their corners for easy reference. Every team will also have four of these wild flower cards in their deck, and these can count as any one of the other four types of flowers when you're playing cards. For example, when taking the build a colony action, I might pick this pedestal and play these two matching red cards and this wild. No matter how many cards you play, you then stack that number of guest pieces from your team's supply onto the chosen space, so three in this case. Then take a pedestal marker from the supply by the board, matching the flower type of that pedestal, red in this case, and set it on top of that colony. You then set all the cards played for that colony into your team's discard pile. Each time you build a colony, it can go anywhere. In other words, the next colony we build could go over here on this space. We don't need to build our colonies near other colonies that we built previously, though there can be advantages to that, as we'll see. And keep in mind, a colony can be a stack of just one piece. If you want, you can play a single card and add a guest to the matching space, setting a pedestal marker on top of it. So you may be thinking, what's the benefit of creating a taller stack? Great question. Any team can build a colony on an empty pedestal. However, you can also build a colony on a space occupied by an opponent's colony, as long as you can play at least one more card than the number of pieces they have there. So if an opponent wanted to take over this colony, which has three guest pieces, they'd need to play at least four cards matching the flower of this pedestal, which the marker on top reminds us of. They could choose to play even more cards just to make it even harder for someone else to take the colony away from them later. Let's say they played five cards matching this space. They would then put five of their guest pieces in this spot, setting the pedestal marker back on top and returning these guest pieces back to its team's supply. This is called knocking off a colony. Just be aware, you can never add more pieces to a colony you already have on the board. So the white team would not be able to add any more pieces to this colony. Only an opponent can come into an already occupied space and change its height. This is why you might want to initially make a bigger stack when building a colony, just to keep other players from taking it over. And we'll see why colonies are important in just a moment. First though, I should point out, you can also always build colonies on the empty spaces that make up the rows along your team's edge of the board. These are known as your home tiles. Colonies built here can use any type of flower card and an opponent can never place a colony in your home tiles spaces, so you can create it with only one card and know it's safe. Also note, colonies you build on your home tiles don't have a pedestal marker placed on top of them. Okay, with that we've covered the build the colony action, so now let's learn the lay a path action. Paths can only be laid between two of your team's colonies, but it doesn't matter how far away they are. Closer paths are just easier to make, as we'll see. To create a path, you must first map out an unbroken line of empty spaces from one of your colonies to another. For example, I could connect these two colonies by going very directly from here to here, or making a longer winding path like this. 
The important thing to understand is that once you've decided on your path, you must play a flower card from your hand that matches each of the path spaces. For example, by playing these cards, I could follow a path of purple, purple, pink, red, red. Once you've chosen your path and played the matching cards, you then add one of your stone pieces to each of those spaces. You can't create a partial path. Any path must connect one of your colonies to another colony, though there is one exception that we'll discuss in a moment. Once a path connects two of your colonies, those colonies can never be taken over by another player. To show this, return the pedestal pieces on top of those colonies back to the supply and take back all of your guest pieces except one from each colony. This will leave your team's beetle symbol on top as a reminder that those colonies are protected and no more pieces can ever be added to those spaces. I should also point out that stone pieces are permanent as well. They can never be moved or removed from the spaces they're placed in. And just like colonies, paths can be placed anywhere. You don't have to start a path from your home tiles or ensure that one path connects to another. All that matters is that a path runs from any one of your colonies to another. That said, now that we know these rules, I want to add to something I said earlier. I've been saying you can only take the lay a path action if you're connecting two of your colonies. That's true, but the path can also run from one of your colonies to one of your already laid paths, because this is also connecting one of your colonies to another one. You could even create a path that connects one of your paths to another one of your paths, since, again, you're also effectively connecting two of your colonies. Creating colonies and linking them with paths is important because, remember, our goal is to create an unbroken path of our pieces from one of our home tile sides to the other. That said, we have one other action to go over that you can instead take on your turn, passing flowers. But you can only perform this action in games where you have a teammate. First, pick one of your team's collection cards and pass up to that number of cards from your hand to a teammate then flip the related collection card to its other side. Just keep in mind the 15 card hand limit. If you pass flowers and your partner ends up with more than 15 cards in their hand, they must discard back down. This pass flowers action can be really helpful when you might have some of the cards necessary for an important play, but not all of them, and hope your opponent might be holding the rest. But this brings up a very important rule, the golden rule of silence. During the game, you're not allowed to discuss the cards you're holding or give hints or suggestions about what each other should do. Players must instead use intuition to work together. As an example, you can't say things like, I really need red flowers, or, oh, I'll be able to connect these two colonies, or we should take over that spot. Your teammate shares your goal, but you're not allowed to directly strategize together. With that, though, we've covered the four actions. Collect flowers, build a colony, lay a path, and pass flowers. And on your turn, you pick exactly one of them to perform. After that, the next player in clockwise order takes their turn. Around and around the table you'll go until one team has formed an unbroken line of stones and colonies connecting a colony anywhere within one of their home tile spaces on one side to a colony anywhere within their other home tile side. And keep in mind, you can have any number of colonies within your home tile sides. As soon as a team has made one of these unbroken connections, the game immediately ends and they win. A team also wins if they create paths that would make it impossible for their other opponents to ever create an unbroken line between their home sides. So in addition to making connections, be sure you aren't allowing yourself to be cut off. If you have a game with three teams, it's possible that just one of the teams will get cut off from being able to win, and if this happens, they're immediately eliminated. They leave their pieces in play, but they won't take any more turns for the rest of the game, while the other two teams continue. Speaking of which, there are a couple of key rules when you have five players specifically. First of all, when seated at the table, Team C is always the single player, and we'll pretend they're seated in this position, and that means they won't have a partner across from them over here. Turns are then taken in this order. First, the Team A member here, then the Team B member here, and then the Team C player here. Then the other player on Team A goes, and the second player on Team B. When it gets to this spot, the lone Team C player seated here takes a turn again, and then you repeat this cycle. 
In this way, team C and its one player will always get a turn after A and B. And don't forget, during setup, team C, which has the single player, will always start with seven cards while the other players start with five cards each. I should also mention, none of the pieces in the game are meant to be limited. If you run out of stones, guests, or pedestal markers, just use a suitable replacement. Otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Garden Guests. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.